Um, the first thing I'll say is my slides are um, images, so I'm not sure they're going to come in a great lot of use for you later, but I'm happy to share my notes if you like. Um, so I'm not going to talk about GDPR, and I'm also not going to talk about data breaches tonight. So there's something new in a privacy presentation. Um, <laughs> Here are the industry perspectives that I am going to talk about. Um, the first thing is um, this concept of trust, which is now such a buzzword, and what do we mean about that, and what are organisations thinking about it? Um, the second thing is the rise of literacy and consumer expectations. Um, and the third thing is how these factors driving industry are leading to a massive talent shortage and the, some of the thoughts and data around that. So I hope that's okay. I just thought I'd bring a different perspective than the one you'd probably expect. Um, and I know I'm sick of hearing about GDPR, so there's a start. Um, okay, so the first thing I said I was going to talk about is trust and this kind of um, shift to thinking about, from privacy to thinking about trust. And by way of example, when I was working at Commonwealth Bank, my title was... Um, it had digital trust and privacy in the title. And my boss said to me, you know, I really think we should drop privacy from the title and just call it digital trust because that's, that's what I'm seeing overseas. Uh, it's all about digital trust and trust. And I said to him, yeah, I kind of get where you're coming from, but people here within CBA will not understand. You know, it's already a challenge to get them to engage on privacy, but if we take it out of the title, they definitely will not come to me because they won't know what I do. We, you know, that dialogue around trust just wasn't there. And I think that now that time has changed because I'm seeing a lot of job titles and team names all over the place that have trust in it and people seem to get that that's a concept in data management. So, so it does seem to have changed. Um, <clears throat> so what is trust and what are we talking about here? Um, and what does it mean economically? Well, there has been quite a bit of writing on it. Um, the World Economic Forum has estimated that the value of trust in the digital economy could be worth one trillion dollars. And their specific point here, um, actually this is a quote from um, Boston Consulting Group, um, was that take the case of online retail, one part of the personal data ecosystem. Um, the sector could grow by anywhere from 1.5 trillion to 2.5 trillion by 2016. So this is a 2011 quote. That difference of one trillion dollars serves as a signal um, for the potentially tens of trillions of dollars of economic impact at stake um, when trust is considered. So interesting to think about it in economic terms. Um, another example more recently, uh, which I just read yesterday, was um, in The Guardian, and they were talking about um, the, the production of documents by Facebook uh, in the recent Cambridge Analytica uh, issues. And they said that Facebook has lost more than $1 billion, $100 billion in value since March when it was exposed how Cambridge Analytica had harvested the data from 87 million users. So there's a direct economic impact caused by um, a loss of trust, arguably probably compliance issues as well. But really at the heart of this is an issue where we trusted them to do one thing and we were surprised when the outcome was actually quite different. Perhaps we shouldn't have been surprised. Um, so, what does trust mean to industry? Um, it's such a difficult concept to, to apply in a business and industrial sense that I had to go back to the dictionary and look at what trust means in a general sense. So, some of the words that you will find when you start to look up these definitions, safety, reliability, truth, competence and competency, um, helpful as a starting point. But then I thought, well, let's look at trusted brands and try and understand well, what does trust in a brand mean and I've pulled up some of Australia's most trusted brands. Um, this year's Roy Morgan survey listed Aldi as the most trusted brand in Australia and usually when I present on trust I'd like to, to ask the audience why? Why is Aldi number one in trust? Any thoughts on this one? They're less gimmicky. Less it's an interesting one because you can argue it both ways but some of the things that I've heard people say is you know um, you know exactly what you're going to get the quality is very good it's um, very consistent um, they have made effort to respond to 
issues in the press. So, for example, the honey issue that we had recently about um, fake products in honey. Um, Aldi was straight out with their press release that they will not endorse that and that doesn't align with the Aldi values. And, you know, that's them playing on trust as a differentiator. Um, so it's an interesting one. The other point that's come up in the debate is that we distrust Coles and Woolies because we have a longer history with them. So we kind of know all the mistreatment of suppliers and, I mean, th these are things people have said, I don't necessarily know or hold that view, but that we, we know a lot more about those brands, whereas Aldi's new to the market, so they get the benefit of the doubt. It's an interesting one. Um, there's a really good um, business lecturer called Rachel Botsman, who I would encourage you to look up. She's done a lot of, of TED Talks, um, so if you're not a great reader, or I suspect a lot of you here will be, um, her videos are great, and she talks about trust as a, a confident relationship with the unknown. So her subject matter is mostly um, about um, the peer-to-peer -peer economies and how is trust um, captured and, um, I guess, leveraged when we are dealing with people that we don't know. So, for example, Uber and Airbnb. Um, so I really encourage you to look at Rachel's, Rachel's work there. Um, I guess that's probably, um, that's probably a good starting point um, for us to move on to some points about compliance and just to say that trust is more than compliance so um, being trustworthy is more than saying that you align to the law um, privacy laws are a really good start and if they weren't then I probably wouldn't have a job so privacy laws are really important um, but here are some reasons why compliance does not equal trust and compliance alone won't build trust so the first point is that most Australian businesses are actually exempt from the Privacy Act because of the $3 million uh, threshold. Um, and that is one of the many reasons why Australian legislation is considered inadequate by EU standards. Didn't mention the G <laughs> word. Um, secondly, and what I see, I work with a lot of different businesses and other and government and, and government and business, is that there's huge variabilities in the way that organisations um, implement privacy. So they might say they're compliant but do things in a pretty substandard way and arguably still be compliant. They might have a really high risk tolerance. So I think businesses will largely acknowledge that you have to take a risk-based approach to compliance a lot of the time. Um, and if their risk appetite's quite high, then you're going to have a different outcome as a consumer. Um, the the third point I wanted to make is that consumer expectations have moved above the law, uh, and that's we'll go into that a little bit in in a short while. Um, and the fourth thing that I wanted to say is that um, compliance frameworks at the moment don't really equip us for dealing with some of the ethical quandaries that secondary uses of data throw up. So, you just because you put it in your privacy policy, that probably means you're setting expectations with consumers, and you may legally be allowed to do it. But at the same time, businesses will often know that consumers don't read privacy policies. The regulators are now even saying that. So from an ethical standpoint, when we then use data in a way that was buried on page 75 of the privacy policy, are we being ethical? Um, you can be compliant, but not be ethical. Here's a good one. Um, okay, so... Um, as Matt read out, I do have a history in working with eHealth and I worked for NETA, which preceded um, the opera operationalisation of the My Health Record system. Um, I have sort of been very close to the debate on the My Health Record system. Um, but I'm going to use this as a case study for the rise of consumer literacy. Um, to, and I guess the point that I'm going to get to is that the dinner, the dinner table conversation has shifted from um, are you using that app, oh, I don't like it, do you trust them, to what do you think about uh, the release of data to enforcement agencies without a warrant and what do you think about um, Section 95 of the Act and strange, very technical things. So I think that there really has been a rise in, in literacy. So here's the example. Um, the issue in a nutshell, distrust in the system. Fair? Fair to say? Um, following the first month of opt-out, the Senate referred 
the following matters to the Senate Community Affairs References Committee. The decision from opt-in to opt-out, privacy and security, including vulnerability, third-party access, including for research, commercial interests and insurance. Um, how well the government had done the public information campaign, whether informed consent could be said to be prevalent, prevalence of informed consent, um, and measures that are necessary to address privacy concerns in the community. Um, I had a look at some of the issues raised in the submissions, and they were really quite technical. Examples, distrust in secondary uses by government, matters of safety, especially for vulnerable people, trust and transparency, uh, and here's a quote I just wanted to read. Um, this was from the Consumers Health Forum. Um, it should be noted that the public's attitude towards my health record is also affected by several other contextual factors. These include news making cyber incidents such as the Cambridge Analytica scandal or the unauthorised access of health information in Singapore's hospital system. Um, any well conceived communications and issues management strategy needs to take such context into account. So we all are hyper aware right now to all of these issues and that is the context that my health records opt out period um, began in. Um, so other issues, secondary uses and disclosures and governance, so that's around the law enforcement, release of data for law enforcement, and third parties and endpoints. So I guess the point that I'm making here is these are submissions of interest groups and I acknowledge that, but they're not dissimilar to the consumer conversations that are happening uh, with my friends on Facebook and ironically, isn't that ironic? Mm -hmm. Let's say WhatsApp, anybody? No, probably not. Um, you know, these are conversations that I'm having with my mum who previously has not really engaged even in my career. Um, <laughs> just that she, you know, she's asking these questions now and, and it's, it is quite technical. So um, I think the point is made that the, the, the dialogue that consumers are engaging in now is really of a higher level than it has been in the past. Um, so that was the second point, that, um, that um, there has been a rise in, in literacy amongst consumers and that is what businesses and government are now having to um, aim to meet. Um, the third trend that I really wanted to discuss was the lack of talent. So um, what, we, what we've now said is um, there are, there's now this focus on trust there is an understanding that compliance is not enough. Um, there are, there's a, a well-recognised um, lesson to learn from MHR that if you don't gain trust, you may see your whole project fail. And so businesses are now needing more and more privacy people than ever before. Um, back to Europe, the regulators have estimated that around um, 75,000 DPOs are going to be needed to meet the requirements of the GDPR and other equivalent frameworks. I said it, sorry. Um, so the GDPR does require a DPR, DPO um, for entities that do processing and meet certain um, characteristics, in, I guess. Um, this is the first time that we've seen a mandated requirement for a DPO. In Australia, we don't have an equivalent obligation, although from July of this year, Commonwealth agencies now have to have a privacy officer and a, re and an, um, a, a designated privacy champion at a senior management level. So it's, it's a similar trend that we're seeing there. So with 75,000 DPOs needed globally, um, and, I, and probably, you know, I can tell you that the privacy community in Australia would be in the hundreds, not in the thousands, and we would be sort of seeing the same levels of need as we're seeing around the world. This is where I'm gonna end with a call to action. Um, have I, hopefully, wrapping this up right in my time. Um, if you are considering a career that is about problem solving, that is about law, that is about policy, that is about marketing and communications, privacy is a great profession. And this is the perfect time to get involved because these debates are so relevant. So if anyone would like to have a chat about that when we finish up, I would welcome that conversation. That was pretty much it.